Alrighty guys, we're going to go ahead and get started with our creating scatter plot notes. And you guys should know what a scatter plot is, and hopefully you remember how to graph in general. So graphing is a great tool to have because it helps us take our data and be able to visualize it and see trends more easily. Uh, fortunately, we have Google Sheets and stuff, which is going to help us to build most of our graphs. But in order for us to understand how that works, we need to understand what all the variables are, how a proper graph is, and how to build one by hand. So if we look at our key checklist here, first things first, we wanna know how to create a title and axes labels. So whenever we have a graph, we're gonna be graphing our independent variable and our dependent variable. The independent variable is the variable that we are manipulating. So this is the one that I control. That's why it's independent with an I is because I control it, I can change it. This variable is gonna be written along the horizontal axis. So if we look at our graph right here, the horizontal axis is this one down here, meaning the X axis. So our independent variable goes just like this. Next, our dependent variable, or the one that depends on the independent variable, in other words, responds to the variable that we manipulated, is going to go on the y-axis. So that's gonna go up here, our dependent variable. Units, we always wanna make sure that we're including units on our variables, so we know exactly what our slope is gonna be, and we'll talk about slope later on as well. But our units are going to be written in parentheses, just like this. And then units down here. Make sure you have units on both your X and Y axes. Next, we're gonna talk about the title on our graph. And the title is in the format of dependent versus independent. In other words, your Y axis versus your X axis. So D versus I. If you remember Y versus X, you'll be in great shape. Let's go ahead and practice some of this stuff. So for each of the experiments listed below, we're gonna write the independent and dependent variable on the appropriate axes and we're gonna be sure to include units and write a title for the graph using the examples to help us, okay? So here's our first example, and it says a farmer wants to know if there is a relationship between the amounts of fertilizer in kilograms she uses and how tall her cows are in centimeters. Okay, so which is the one that she's controlling? Can she control the height of her cow? No. What she can control though, is the amount of fertilizer she gives her cow. So the amount of fertilizer is our independent variable. Therefore, how tall the cows are gonna grow is our dependent variable, which makes sense because the cow's height, I just realized it said corn. Um, the corn's height is dependent on the amount of fertilizer she is giving the grass. So if we look at our title, our title is Y versus X. Our Y variable was corn height, and our X variable was amount of fertilizer. Let's take a look at number one now. Does this length, does the length of time an ice cube is in water affect the temperature of the water in degrees Celsius? So we have seconds, we have Celsius, we have temperature of the water. So which one can I control? Can I control the temperature of the water? No. What I can control is the time that the ice cube is in that water. I can put it in for five seconds or I can put it in for 10 seconds. So my independent variable, the one that I control, goes on my x-axis, is going to be the length of time an ice cube is in water. And we need units for this. So what was the units that we're using in this experiment? It's right here, seconds. So I'm just gonna abbreviate with the letter S. Next, my Y variable, that's the one that depends on my independent. My independent is the length of time. What am I measuring here? Well, I'm measuring the temperature of that water. And I can't really write this sideways, so I'm just gonna write it like this. Temp of water. And what are the units of that temperature of water? Well, the units are degrees Celsius. Now we need a title for this graph. We said title is Y versus X. Our Y is temperature of water, and our X is time 
and ice cube is in the water. So temp of water versus time in water. Cool. All right, one down, one more to go. Is there a relationship between the number of hours a student studies and the score he or she gets on a test? So this one's a little bit more difficult because they're not giving us as many clues, but let's really think about it and see if we can identify what that independent variable is. So the independent variable is what I control. Can I control the score I get on a test? No. What can I control? I can control the amount of time that I put in that test. So my independent variable for this one would be the number of time spent studying. And what is that time measured in? Well, it tells me right here, hours. So my units are going to be hours and I'll abbreviate with HR. Next, I need my dependent variable. What am I measuring here? Well, I'm measuring the score that I receive on that test. So my dependent variable would be score received on test. And what is my score measured in? What are the units? Well, the units of my score is percentage. Make sure I put that in parentheses. Now I need a title. So my title is Y versus sex. So therefore my title is just score versus time spent studying. All right, first part's done. Let's make our way to the next part. So over here, we have axes and we wanna talk about scaling those axes. So when you guys are building a graph, like right now we just identified our axes, but when we build this graph, we're gonna need more than just our variables. We're gonna need some numbers in order to put our data on it. And if we don't have a good scale, our data is gonna look very skewed and it might give us the wrong idea about what we're doing. So in order to do that, we need to choose for each of the axes, a scale that is numbered with consistent intervals. That's important. So consistent meaning like two, four, six, eight, something where it goes up by the same number every time. We also wanna choose a scale that will make the data cover most of the page. We have the whole page, we, ought as, we might as well use it. We have the whole page, we might as well use it. The scale can be different for each axis, that's fine. So our X axis could go up by 10 and our Y axis could go up by 20, that's okay. So what I recommend we do here is that we count the spaces that we have if we need to, but this one's a little bit easier. So this one we can see that we go from zero to two, so that already told us what our scale is. Our scale is gonna go up by two every time. So two, that means this is four, six, eight, 10, and 14. Pretty easy. Let's take a look at the next one, zero to five. So our scale is just five here. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Next one, zero, 0 0.5. Our scale is just 0 0.5, 1.5, two. But it's not just two, it's 2.0, right? Because this is 1.0, 2.5, 3.0. Next, we have one where we don't have the uh, starter value. We just have a zero and then a blank, then a 50. So we need to figure out what this one is here. This line is halfway between zero and 50. So I just do 50 divided by two. That's gonna give me 25. So I should go zero, 25. I add 25 to it, I'm at 50. I add another 25, I'm at 75. Another 25, 100, one more, 125, and lastly, 150. Now let's look at one where we don't have any of that information, we just have the tick marks. And this is the type of data that we're gonna have. So in order to do this, what I recommend is that we count all the tick marks. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six tick marks, and we know that our data goes up to 24. So I'm gonna take the maximum value of my data and divide it by the number of tick marks I have that are not zero. So 24 divided by six, that's going to give me four, meaning that my data is gonna go up by four each time. So four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, perfect. Now we're gonna talk about drawing the best fit line. So after you have your data made, and this is really particular for um, handwritten data, you wanna draw a line 
that is going to go through most of your data points. So it has an even number or close to it of data points above the line and a pretty even number of data points below the line. After we've graphed the data, we should be able to look at it and figure out what's going on and write a relationship about it. If I were to look at this data above in this graph, how could I describe this? Well, as the automobile speed increases, because I see here that this speed is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So as speed increases, what happens to my dependent variable? Well, it looks like the cost of the average ticket goes up. So cost of ticket increases. The two types of relationships that we can have for our graphing is a direct relationship or an inverse relationship. So a direct relationship is when both of our variables go in the same direction. So they both increase or they both decrease. That is a direct relationship. So if we look at this graph here, they're both going up. This is a direct relationship. The next one that we have is an inverse relationship. And for an inverse relationship, that's gonna be slightly different. So direct is when both go up and inverse is when one goes up and the other goes down or when one goes down and the other goes up. So they're going in opposite directions. So if we look at our initial examples here, I would assume that this graph that has score versus time spent studying will mostly be a direct relationship. The more time you spend studying, the better your score will be. So if we look at this one, the length of time an ice cube is in water and the temp of that water, that's going to be a inverse relationship. The longer that ice cube is in the water, the colder that water should get. Another idea of an inverse relationship that I like to say is as my wife's happiness increases, right? So here's her happiness. Um, the amount of money in my wallet decreases. Alrighty, so now we're gonna take a look at finding the slope. So when we find the slope, something important to note is that the slope has units and those units are equal to the Y units divided by the X units. This is something that a lot of people forget. Make sure you don't highlight it, write it down somewhere so you don't forget. Here is our equation for the slope. Something I will give you, all right? But it's also something I would expect you to know. So let's use the data table to the right to figure out our slope. I've already highlighted the values that I want you to use. I recommend using the last value and the second values. So if I look at this, I just need to plug into my equation, y2 minus y1. y2 is right here, that's 210. y1 is right here, that's 40. Divided by x2, which is 95, minus x1, which is 10. I go ahead and do the math, and I end up with 170 divided by 85. I want to simplify this. And if I simplify, I just end up with two over one. But wait, I just told you slope has units. So what were the Y units? Well, my Y values over here. So the Y units are money. And what are the X units? The X units are miles per hour. So what does that mean? That means that our, my slope is two over one dollars over miles per hour. So what this slope is really telling me is that I pay $2 for every one mile per hour over the speed limit I go. So if I'm going like five miles over the speed limit, I would pay an extra $10. If I'm going 10 miles over the speed limit, I would pay $20, so on and so forth. All right, now that we're at our last part here, this is gonna talk about the equation of a line. And the equation of the line is gonna help us take all the information that we talked about before, so our slope, our data, and tell us how to make educated guesses about possible values of our data in situations that we might not be able to test for. So first things first, we have this equation, y equals mx plus b. So let's identify what y is. y is just whatever's on our y variable. If we're looking at the data above, that's gonna be cost. Next, we're gonna look at m. m stands for slope. Then we have x whatever our x variable was, and that was speed in this case. And lastly, we have b, which is our y-intercept. So what we need to do is we need to take all that data and put it together. 
So I plug in cost for y. So cost is equal to m, my slope. Well, what was my slope? I just solved for it. That was $2 divided by one mile per hour. So I can just ignore the one and write $2 over miles per hour. And then I see it's m times x, so slope times x, my x is speed, and then lastly, my y-intercept. So the y-intercept is the value of y when x is 0. So when x is 0, y is also 0. 99% of the time, your y-intercept is just going to be 0. Now that we have this equation in line, we could use it to make an estimate of what certain data points would be. So like I said before, if I said to you, how much would it cost me if I was going 100 miles per hour? Well, 100 miles per hour is my speed, so all I have to do is plug that into my equation. So my cost is equal to $2 divided by miles per hour, and my speed, well, I just told you I was going 100 miles per hour, plus zero. What do I do? I just solve this equation. That tells me that if I was going 100 miles per hour, I would expect the ticket somewhere around $200. And on the flip side, say somebody told you they got a $50 ticket, we could figure out how fast they were going above the speed limit. So $50 is cost, so I would plug 50 in for cost. $2 is my slope over miles per hour times my speed, which I'm solving for this time. How do I solve for speed? Well, I gotta get it by itself. So I just take my slope and divide it over to the other side. That means 50 divided by two is equal to 25 miles per hour. That's the speed at which somebody would have to be going in order to pay $50 in a ticket.